Hi, my name is Silvia Mazzoni. I'm a researcher at UC Berkeley, and I'm here to talk about retrofits and retrofit policies that we observed during our reconnaissance trip to Italy after the 2016 Central Italy earthquake sequence. My objective in this presentation is to give an overview of an evaluation of seismic retrofit implementation in Italy, as well as assess the value of a retrofit policy in the framework of resiliency. The focus of this is to really look at that you don't want to let communities disperse. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll give you a setting in Italy, uh, the value of retrofit and retrofit policies, what brought on these retrofit policies in Italy, and then I'm going to get into a little bit of structural engineering of looking at building types and retrofit schemes that we saw during the reconnaissance. And I'm going to finish with talking about the SISMA bonus, which is the most recent effort uh, of retrofit policies in Italy. Italy has a fascinating long and short history in both earthquakes and politics. It was not unified until 1861. So as much as you see here that there have been repeated earthquakes in specific regions and other regions in Italy, uh, there, it wasn't until 150 years ago that we have a unified country that could even establish a unified seismic design and retrofit policy. It's fascinating to see that the main regions are the Apennine region, which is the central Apennine region, which is where this latest uh, earthquake sequence occurred. Uh, significant earthquakes have also happened near Naples and down in Sicily at the border with Calabria. After the September reconnaissance trip, I had one narrative to show that pretty much we see in these pictures that the only thing that has really changed is the quality of our photographs, but the type of damage that we see in the towns hasn't really changed, mainly because these towns are over 100 years old, oftentimes, especially in the historical centers. My narrative of observing total collapse in historical centers changed when we went back to Italy in May of 2017, and we visited the town of Norcia, a relatively larger town, with still several historical buildings, um, but it was the closest to the largest magnitude earthquake. It was actually closest to also to the Amatrice earthquake. Uh, but we observed that the damage was pervasive through the town, yes, but it was definitely a different level of damage. Very few collapses um, or even near collapses, except during the church's historical walls and historical buildings. In many of these towns in Italy, we have to attribute the success uh, to the implementation of retrofits in the buildings. Uh, we see here the value of a retrofit. Here we have a well done engineered uh, retrofit which has maintained the building intact during the entire earthquake sequence. Now we see here the value of the retrofit itself in the scheme of an individual building, but in the end what is the point of retrofitting your own building when everyone else around you loses their homes. It's almost a contradiction on Rudyard Kipling's uh, poem that if we don't all keep our head together, there really isn't anything left to our town. Having gone to Italy twice uh, during the seismic sequence, we were able to observe the damage in the town of Amatrice in September and compare it to the damage to the town of Norcia in May. In Amatrice, which was the closest earthquake, was magnitude 6.2 in August, it suffered even more damage than we see here during the October 30th event. On the other hand, if you see below, this is Norcia, which was actually the closest, closer to both uh, magnitude 6.2 and 6.6 .6 earthquakes, and we see there's relatively little damage. Most of the media focused on the damage to the cathedral that you see here. Uh, but if you look at the overall town, there were actually very few collapses. And we attribute this to a more uniform implementation of retrofits that we observed throughout the town of Narcha as compared to the historical center of Amatrice. You can guess that what really affected the response of these two earth towns is really the amount of retrofit in the town. And that amount of retrofit and the implementation of retrofit policies in the town is, can only rely on the recent history. 
And as you can see here in this graphic on the left, we have a matrice, and there was a very quiet period uh, before the 1900s, which is pretty much when most of these buildings were built. Why were they built then? Because this was following a larger sequence of significant damage uh, to the town um, in the late 1600s and early 1700s. Um, typically of Italy and most regions, after there's a significant damage to a town, it gets rebuilt. Um, in Norcia, similar history, but it's been a much more almost regular earthquakes. Uh, so you can see this earthquake in 1700s um, that had an intensity of 10. It sounds like it likely destroyed the, whole, the entire town and the town rebuilt. But then it, it almost kept on renewing itself after so many damaging earthquakes and we see the curve of intensity actually goes down. Very important earthquake for Norcia was the one in 1979, which actually caused a lot of damage to the town. And so now you can say, oh, all right, well, not that the town was rebuilt in 1979, but that was definitely a wake-up call to implement some retrofit policies. And because of this earthquake, we see the success, let's say, in the overall response of the town. And th this history that we see repeated for these two towns is really what's been driving uh, the retrofit policies in Italy. Before the 1900s, as I said, Italy was not a unified country, so there were definitely strengthening and design policies, but they were localized to these uh, regions and towns themselves. But the 1960s is really the beginning of modern codes, just as it is in, here in California. Um, but the most important date for more than uh, design codes, but really the implementing earthquake policy, retrofit policy, was the magnitude 6 2002 earthquake in Molise. Not a large earthquake uh, with not significant damage, but the school collapse in San Giuliano, which killed an entire class of 27 children plus one teacher, uh, really, and, and this was the dawn of uh, social media, it really resonated across the entire country that something had to be done. Uh, in the town, a whole generation is gone uh, because of that entire first grade class. So you'll see it that they talk about the 1996 children um, being gone from that town. Uh, this was an earthquake in an area of what was considered low seismicity. Um, and the building had actually been strengthened in recent times, but the construction was poor. So two things uh, were key because of this event. Uh, one is we needed new uh, seismic zones on the, uh, maps in Italy and something needed to be done about schools to keep children uh, safe. So in 2003, there was a national update to the seismic zonation maps, and actually a government ordinance was established that required the assessment of the end of the vulnerability of critical structures, such as schools and hospitals, and of the infrastructure within five years. It provided funding for strengthening, as well as guidelines on evaluation and strengthening techniques. But it was, not a, it was relatively mandatory, but as you know, things in Italy can get postponed, uh, but uh, there's definitely been a movement towards uh, implementation of strengthening in both schools and hospitals. Um, in 2008, a uh, performance-based design approach uh, was introduced in the building code, which was actually European standard. Uh, so now you can almost assume and expect modern construction to be uh, earthquake resistant, um, but Building inventory is different, and most of the building inventory is over 100 years old. Uh, the 2016 Central Italy sequence that we're talking about here, which lasted six months, had a significant impact on the perception of seismic safety and especially vulnerability in Italy. And that prompted a program by the government called Sisma Bonus, which is a tax incentive, uh, finally, for the private sector because the government was just spending too much time and money in evaluating and pretty much cleaning up uh, the damage from this earthquake. And in Italy, and here we get specific, but again, you can really take this and export it and extrapolate it to other building types and conditions in other places. But there's two primary building types. One is the unreinforced masonry structures, which are older buildings, 
uh, highly vulnerable. And two is reinforced concrete structures, which are very popular from the 1960s on. Uh, but there's a, an issue, technical issue, of the deformation of compatibility with the non-structural infills that are used for uh, thermal insulation. The fascinating issue here is that uh, unreinforced masonry buildings have been retrofit, uh, while very few reinforced concrete structures have been retrofit, as you can see here. And so a lot of work has been done in looking at types of retrofits in masonry structures in Italy. And we have here examples of pretty much keeping the mechanics together by providing wall ties, which are very effective in making the structure act as a whole. But if you don't have integrity in the walls themselves, uh, the wall ties are not very effective. And so to maintain integrities, uh, you can apply reinforced plaster to both sides of the walls, or even if possible to at least one side. Uh, repointing, which is pretty much replacing the existing poor quality grout, um, and placement of a concrete uh, bond beam in the perimeter of the wall, typically done at the roof level and at the individual building levels. So we see in this image here that wall ties do work. Uh, they work very well, especially in this case of having the whole building act as a unit. But when you're really trying to just apply wall ties alone to a building, you see that it doesn't always work. You may have a total collapse or at least losing integrity of the building itself. Uh, you see here on the bottom left image, though, if you combine these wall ties with a ring beam, definitely you have improved uh, seismic response. Concrete beams is something that's been criticized uh, in, from this last earthquake. A lot of collapses where you see that the uh, roof uh, structures actually uh, remains whole while the entire wall around it uh, collapses or partially collapses. Repointing is becoming very popular uh, and it works, um, but I do think that it needs to be combined with improving the structural integrity of the building. So you can see in this picture, and the buildings on the left, in the left image, um, actually sustained all the earthquakes um, after September, while the building on the right, where you already see that not much has been done, uh, eventually collapsed by May. Reinforced plaster is a fascinating um, method of actually maintaining the integrity, and you can see it here. Uh, you you want to combine it with wall ties. Uh, the Hotel Seneca, which is in the historical center of Norcia, of course, had the resources to implement a well-done uh, retrofit throughout the building where you have a combination of wall ties uh, and plaster, and you, you keep the plaster as part of the architectural effects in the building. Uh, the building on the right, which is only a couple of blocks away, you see that the wall ties, uh, even though they look more aged, uh, are doing their work in keeping the building together. Uh, the lack of the reinforced plaster uh, shows the damage to the facade of the building. Reinforced concrete structures, as I said, uh, are highly vulnerable to non-structural damage. Um, and uh, this image that you see on the left is very typical of what we observed in Norcia. Uh, very little if no structural damage, uh, but significant non-structural damage. There is a retrofit implemented for it. But what you want to do is you want to minimize deformations. Um, and so this image on the right is a retrofit that was done for schools where they provided uh, bracing and passive dampers uh, at the floors of this reinforced concrete structure. The main focus of a seismic retrofit policies in Italy has been on critical structures such as hospitals uh, and schools. Hospitals are key in these mountainous regions because they serve a wide uh, radius. And what's typical of these hospital buildings or hospital centers is that there are many wings that are built at different times um, and different building methodologies. And you see on the top right a collage of images from the hospital in Matrice, which had significant structural damage uh, after the uh, August 26th earthquake, and it was evacuated immediately and shut down, and it's out of service. Um, and on the bottom left, you see images from the hospital of Amandola, 
uh, which is farther away from the epicenters, but it actually had non significant non-structural damage uh, during the August 26th earthquake. Uh, interestingly, it was to the reinforced concrete frames, uh, buildings, but if you see here on the left, uh, we have the 1800 uh, wing that actually had uh, pretty much no damage. Um, at the time from the August event, it has non-structural damage, but it was actually had to be fully evacuated in November of 2016 uh, because of additional damage. We didn't get to visit it, so I don't have any images of that. The other important uh, critical structures in Italy are, and everywhere are schools. And you see here an image on the top right of a school in Akumoli, uh, which was a more modern structure placed just outside of the town. Uh, again, it didn't collapse. Uh, there's, uh, you do see some roof damage, um, but if it's not part of an integral retrofit policy, there's no point in having a school building uh, when the entire town is evacuated. Uh, the school in Amatrice, shown here on the bottom left, uh, received a lot of media attention because it had been strengthened, it had been evaluated uh, in accordance with the uh, ordinance of 2003, uh, but it had um, serious collapse uh, in many of its different wings um, and a lot of structural and non-structural damage. Uh, so now it really highlights the value of quality uh, strengthening. Uh, the school in Norcia, which is shown on the bottom right, which I already talked about, is a much more modern structure and it was actually strengthened in 2012 uh, with these uh, dampers. Um, at every floor level, but it was closed because of non-structural damage only, um, and they're actually using alternate buildings at this point. So we see that both in hospitals and schools, a lot more work needs to be done to ensure uh, that they do remain operational during and after an event. And so that brings us to the looking at the private sector in Italy, um, and there's a new um, financial incentive that came out at the beginning of this year uh, for homeowners to strengthen uh, their buildings uh, for both uh, business buildings and uh, residential areas. It's interesting, it's a ta tax deduction program where the percent of amount that you can uh, deduct is depending on whether, on the level of improvements uh, that are made, whether you improve by one uh, risk classification, um, for your building or two or more, and it depends on the type of evaluation and retrofit you um, do. The, the most important thing here is that there are date restrictions. This needs to be done by 2021, um, which hopefully will really get the private sector moving into reducing uh, the cost to the government on damage uh, to buildings and towns. It's a risk evaluation based on, uh, must be actually done by a licensed engineer. Uh, you do a preliminary evaluation and you do a design and implementation of a strengthening screen. Um, the classification is based on mean annual losses and actually doing a demand capacity uh, risk ratio. And uh, there's a simplified and a conventional method of analysis. So in summary and conclusion, because I had to go relatively quickly here is, you know, it's very important to keep in mind that in visual reconnaissance, it's always easier to see what didn't work than what did work. But we did see a lot of buildings, especially in Norcia, that had pretty much no visual damage from the outside. And we do know that retrofits do work when they're well designed and constructed, uh, but we do need to look at strengthening and implement it in an entire town and community if we want to really look at uh, building resiliency into our community. At this point I would like to acknowledge my appreciation of EERI and their leadership in organizing these EERI teams but also in providing collaboration with the two centers in Europe, the EU Center uh, with the leadership of Guido Magenis and the Re Luis Center uh, with the leadership of Angelo Massi. Uh, they organized our visits, uh, being able to meet with engineers, uh, and people on the street, uh, and they were vital in making sure that we were able to access all the restricted zones. I'd also like to acknowledge appreciation of Professor Stewart and the GEAR team and the support that they provided before our trip since they had gone ahead of us and 
giving us a heads up of what to do and where to go, um, as well as all the collaboration that we have done since. So thank you for your attention.